So it's a great pleasure that he said yes to the invitation to deliver the Dudleyan lecture this evening. It will be on the beginnings of consciousness. Please welcome Professor Syed Hossein Nasser. The subject that I, was, I chose after being invited to del deliver this oldest of all formal lectures at Harvard University was a theme which has been very much on my mind the last few years and I entitled it in the beginning was consciousness. Uh, this may sound as a somewhat strange title but I chose this on purpose. I believe that we are at the present moment at the cusp of the curve of life, what the French call cours de vie, of the paradigm which has dominated Western civilization since the Renaissance. And this transformation that is coming about has at its heart this question, as we shall find out very soon. It was about 50 years ago, right on this campus, when with Thomas Kuhn, who died recently, unfortunately, before finishing his work, a major th American philosopher of science, as many of you know, and a few others were struggling and grappling and wrestling with this question of paradigm shifts. He and I did not exactly agree on what it was, but we both felt that uh, there's a major change that is afoot. And of course, these things do not come so quickly, as he himself pointed out, it is very important writings, it takes some time. But I do believe that it is a time that the most important questions that face present-day civilization will involve not only solutions within the present parameters within which we think, but those parameters themselves, that is the paradigm within which human beings carry out their intellectual and also practical activities. So in the beginning was consciousness. And the original title of my talk was not only in the beginning was consciousness, but in the beginning is consciousness. Because this in the beginning is not simply a past time, it involves a principal reality. Let me begin by quoting from several of the sacred scriptures of the world. In the Rig Veda, the oldest of all Hindu sacred scriptures, we read, one alone is the dawn beaming over all this. It is the one that severally becomes all this. The one who is sit, sat, shit, and ananda, that is both all three being Bless, uh, um, state of being blessed or in state of bliss and of course consciousness, chit. Same in the Tao Te Ching, the pr primary text of Taoism and also its influence upon Neo-Confucianism of course we all know. The nameless Tao is the beginning of heaven and earth. The name Tao is the mother of 10,000 things. So the, at the origin you have the Tao, which in fact is consciousness, I shall come to consciousness in a moment. And of course, we all know the book of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In chapter 6 of the book of John, Christ said that my Word is spirit and life. So this Word is not simply Word in the ordinary sense, but it's spirit and life. And finally in the Quran, in chapter 36, the Surah Yasin, but his command, when he intendeth a thing, is only that he saith unto it be, and it is. And so the origin is very explicitly stated in the Quran to be the command of God, which is itself as the word Amr, A-M-R, is considered to be on the level of what we call Logos in the Logos theories of theology and philosophy, Logos doctrines. Now when we turn to traditional philosophies all over the world, uh, we see this almost remarkable unanimity we think of the zero, of the lambda, of Pythagoras. We think of the To Agathon, of Plato, Aristotle's divine intellect. We think of the essay of St. Thomas Aquinas, with the capital E, of course, which is also consciousness, which knows the divine being, and its correspondence, of course, in Islamic philosophy, to which St. Thomas Aquinas was so uh, close. And outside of the circle of Western Asia and Europe in the Abrahamic world, of course, we think of Atman in Advaita Vedanta in Hindu metaphysics, which is pure consciousness, the self, which is the origin of all things, 
and also the role of the Tao and the new Confucian philosophies of the 12th, 13th century. You can go on and on and on. So where is the exception? The exception really is to be found in the world in which we happen to be living. Before modern times, there were philosophies for which consciousness was not primary and in the beginning. We see it in the Greco-Roman antiquity, we see it in certain schools of Hinduism, but they were really minor. They did not dominate over the vision, over the world view, the Weltanschauung of the civilizations in question. Uh, <coughs> and in all of these civilizations, there was a mentality in which in the beginning did not imply only a beginning in time somewhere back there. We shall come back to that, it's very important. It's very significant that in English we say in the beginning was the word. In the Vulgate it says in principia erat verbum. So in the principia, in principle was the word, and not only temporally. And these other civilizations were all very, very fully aware of this. Now, uh, the reality of the primacy of consciousness begins in modern times at the end of the Renaissance, especially with the scientific revolution. Before I turn to that, uh, it's very important, if we're going to be philosophically serious, of course, to define what we mean by consciousness. Uh, those people who believe that philosophy should only deal with what is operationally definable, that is making philosophy a handmade of physics and engineering, of course, there's certain concepts with which they do not deal. Namely, what's behind me, the word veritas, which should be taken off if not put in the philosophy department because that cannot be defined from the point of operational uh, methods that is used in analytical philosophy. But their universal concept of philosophy is to that which I'm appealing and the traditional understanding of philosophy, which also is very rigorous, but not necessarily operational because it's impossible to define consciousness operationally. Every time you try to define consciousness, consciousness operationally, you have to make use of consciousness in order to do so. It's like the famous uh, saying of Pascal that you cannot define to, to be, because every time you use a sentence, you say, say, that is, it is. And you're already using the verb to be in order to define it, so of course then you have a circular argument and that's not acceptable. Now it's a paradox that something as obvious as consciousness cannot be externally and operationally defined. That is true. But we all know what consciousness is, even if through some kind of solipsism or at least a kind of inward uh, way of uh, deluding ourselves of being the only reality we might deny the world out there, or through some kind of sophism try to deny the reality of consciousness, we do so in both cases through the use of consciousness. Consciousness is the most primary reality with which we judge every other reality. Uh, Consciousness for these traditional civilizations, for religions and philosophies, was not a state. It was a substance. It was not a process. It was something that was, like being itself, which was at once luminous and numinous, at once knowing and knowing that it's knowing, knowledgeable of its own knowledge, at once the source of all sentience, of all experience, and beyond experience by having knowledge that is experiencing something. That is why even the most skeptical philosophers had a great deal of trouble negating it, even those who were skeptics from a religious point of view. 